their background, but apparently that's already in the slides. Sorry, I was going to give a bit of a preamble about it, but it's already in the slides, apparently, the story. Um, unfortunately, Bill's not with us. He's ill at the moment. Hi, Bill. But recovering. He's um, on the end of the live stream. Okay. Hi, Bill. Hi, Bill. Hi, Bill. Hi, Bill. Hi, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, if we go through this, then have questions at the end, I'll hand the microphone around so that people can, on the internet can actually hear what's being said. Right, I'll hand you across to Julia now and take off WUSAT 3. Ollie, if you want to participate as well. You, yeah, you can. Over to you. Thanks, Christian. Can everybody hear me? Can you hear me on the live stream? Wave, Bill. <laughs> you want to put the mic up here, Brian? Yeah. Is that better? Or shall I hold it? Yeah, if I hold it, I won't work either. Good morning, everybody. My name is Julia Hunter Anderson. Uh, with my colleague, Dr. Bill Crofts, we're the co directors of the Warwick University Satellite Program. And we were asked here today to give you a bit of an oversight of our latest project, WUSAT 3. But in doing so, um, I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of how we have got to where we got to. So a little look at the WUSAT program. Then we'll have a, a look at WUSAT 3, wh what we've done in the past, where we are going, and a call to arms. So the WUSAT story. In the beginning, about 13 years ago, Bill visited the University of Southampton, taught Professor Stephen Gabriel about the possibility of collaborating on an ESA project. So the aim was that Warwick would provide the power system for Southampton's gridiron propulsion system for a, a European Space Agency student project called ESMO, which was a moon orbiting project. Bill had no experience of space, but plenty of engineering experience, plenty of enthusiasm and a sort of a drive to learn. So it just so happened there was a coincidence that uh, the head of ESA's education office was visiting Steve at the time and he suggested that rather than just doing the power system for the grid ion propulsion, maybe Warwick wanted to do the whole satellite propulsion system. Bill at this time is thinking, mm, am I getting in over my head? But found himself saying, yes, we can do that. So it was agreed that Warwick would lead the power subsystem. The rest is history. They spent a good six years with fourth year MNG projects designing the power subsystem. Unfortunately, ESA then had to pull the funding and it never launched. Um, but it really set Bill and, and the University of Warwick and the School of Engineering up for continuing with space projects as a great way of teaching our students, like Ole here. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> how to work on real life engineering projects. So just a little bit um, before I go on to what happened next about Warwick and the School of Engineering. We don't do aerospace engineering, which is why Bill had no experience of space engineering. We do general engineering. We have streams, so we have elect electrical, electronic, mechanical, computer science, manufacturing, systems engineering. And in the fourth year of the master's program, we put teams of multidisciplinary engineering streams together and say, go and design a spacecraft, go and design a submarine, go and design a train. So this was just one option of trying to get them to do real world system, systems engineering, real, real world subsystem engineering, project management, admin, outreach, everything. So Bill's next question was, how can I follow ESMO? And at the time, CubeSats, Cal Poly, thank you very much, um, came up with this concept of CubeSats, 10 by 10 by 10 uh, cube and multiples of. Now, I'm very aware that some of you in the audience are fully engaged with AMSAT, designing, building, launching, operating small satellites. Some of you will be interested in listening and talking to and others will have just drifted in from the RSGB convention going, what on earth is that? So I hope this is not 
at too high a level or too low a level. I'm oh. hoping that there's something for everybody. Um, so we took the concept, Bill took the concept of CubeSats and thought, OK, let's not run before we can walk. And he started by trying to get teams to build a small satellite that could be launched on a high altitude balloon. And WUSAT, the concept of WUSAT 1 was born. And in one year, the students designed successfully a, a little one unit CubeSat. It was launched on a high altitude balloon to 33 kilometers. And amazingly, the team predicted where it was going to launch and it landed within a couple of hundred meters of it. Um, so buoyed up with this success, Bill thought, okay, let's do a high altitude balloon next. And managed to get, the team managed to get onto ESA's REXUS program. And they spent two years working with ESA to develop another one unit CubeSat that would be ejected from a REXUS rocket. This is a, a picture of it in the, the, on the launcher within the, so the fairing goes on, on this end here. And in 2016, it was successfully launched. And what was fantastic for a student project was that it was the first ejected module to actually send a signal and it, for it to be received on the ground. So ESA were absolutely <laughs> um, about it, as were we. Um, and from that success, Bill decided that now was the time to sprint. So WUSAT 3 was in the making. Oli is, is, has joined the team two weeks ago, so you can ask him all the questions. <laughs> <laughs> and he's bravely stood up to the, the task of being our communications expert, um, <laughs> with a little bit of attitude determination control thrown in for good measure. So we're now in our fifth year, and that may seem like a really long time to be working on a, a CubeSat, um, when, certainly when people like Chris Bridges over there, hello Chris, can probably throw one together within six months, and you guys from Amtsat probably as well. But we have a number of challenges because we run as a purely educational project, and I'll go through those in a minute. But I wanted to just give an idea of why we do it, to give us an idea of our mentality, because right from Bill saying, yeah, we could do that, to now, that's effectively what we expect our students to do. They have no experience in space. Some of them have been interested in it, yeah. But they've never actually had to design a spacecraft, so we're expecting them to throw caution to the wind, find out how it all works, and come up with a, a sensible design that will be able to be launched. So it's very much education. It's student focused. It's part of the fourth year of the MEng degree. It accounts for 25% of the student credit. It's a multidisciplinary engineering team with Bill and I co-directing. And it's mission driven. And this is, for me, as a space systems engineer, I like to focus on the mission. I want it to be for a reason, whether it's a technology demonstration, like I'm hearing with Fox and Golf, or whether it has something beyond the, the communications or the technology of the, the spacecraft itself. And you'll see about that in a minute. We want our students to be useful in the wider world. So hopefully it's very good for their career. Hopefully it helps some of them to stay in engineering and we do, we have seen that there is a, 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 a big drain to other industries. Not that that's bad, because I think this, the, the thinking is useful across the world. Um, but it would really be nice if we could bridge that skills gap, uh, particularly in the space industry, where we're expecting massive growth. The UK uh, strategy is to have huge growth by 2030, and, and it's been identified that there is a skills gap. So hopefully we are building relevant experience so that students can go into industry relatively hitting the ground running. And outreach. We all know space is cool. Missions with a purpose, though, for, in our experience, seem to be even cooler. 
Um, and our outreach for this particular mission has gone expo exponential. We have a very all-inclusive approach. We love you all, we want you all to be involved. <laughs> so we have a concept called the Woosat Watchers and we, we put out newsletters at this moment in time and as I said, call to arms later on. Hopefully you'll see how we try to be all-inclusive. And really key for this to work is that Bill and I really enjoy it. <laughs> we really enjoy working with the team. It's amazing working with the young minds. They're so innovative, they're so engaged, so motivated. But we, Bill, Bill, we think you're good at it. <laughs> so we do think that we have a formula which seems to work. So in that all-inclusive approach, so Bill and I, I joined the project about three years ago. And just like the chance encounter with uh, the head of ESA um, Education Office. Bill and I met as volunteers at a National Trust property. Bill being the beekeeper, me being the gardener, my first day of work. And our supervisor goes, oh, you work in the space industry as well, don't you? And we got talking and I said, oh, I'm a space systems engineer, just come back to the UK after 13, 20 years away. Um, not sure I'll ever work in the space industry again. And he goes, oh, but I need a systems engineer. And that's how I then became involved on WUSAT 3, which in terms of Bill wanting to sprint was quite good timing. Just an example of some of our students, we have over 80 alumni now, um, of which Ole will be one of them. And we, we, these are our current partners, so from industry, um, whether it be equipment or software or experience, and we'll talk about that a bit in a minute. Uh, just to note, although it's gone off the bottom of the screen, Bill's done a lovely article. Part one is in Oscar News, so if you want to hear a bit more, look in there. So we, we needed to build on our success to have a greater impact, so we've gone now beyond just a fourth year project. We're working with uh, an organisation called the Midlands Innovation Space Group, which is tying in Leicester and Birmingham and Aston and Coventry and Warwick and Nottingham and whoever else. Um, so it, trying to not step on anybody else's toes, but trying to take into account this ambition of the UK government to improve or to increase um, our capability within the UK over the next 10 years. And we want to share the love across the university. So we now have started doing a, a, a mini project which aspires to be space, um, which is called CanSat, which is smaller than a CubeSat, if that's possible, um, inside baked bean tin, uh, that kind of size, where the, the students are set a project, they get pinged off a projectile, and they have to deploy a, a parachute, come down to the ground, taking some measurements as they go. Um, so that's a great way for those who are not in engineering to get involved. So we do have engineers involved, but it's physics, maths, computer science, you name it. So we sat through the project while you're here. This is the story so far. So I did say, why might it take five years to get this far? This is idealistically what we would hope to achieve. We're, the students are only with us for one year. Every year we change the student team. So we have seven to eight students per year and in the summer they go away, they start their jobs, they say goodbye um, and we get a new, new set of students and very rapidly we have to get them up to speed. But because we only have seven or eight students, for those of you who are involved in satellite design, is that mine? Um, you'll realise that's probably not enough to cover all of the different elements of a space system, both the satellite and the ground segment, and the operations and everything else. So we kind of lurch from year to year, and this is, ideally, we're, all, we're going in one direction, but actually this is probably more like what it looks like. You're nodding, Chris, that's good. <laughs> and sometimes I didn't put it in because I thought it was a little bit, but sometimes these arrows go wildly off in other directions. And we, you know, those, those elements of design 
have to happen in order to be moving forward. But it does slow things down. It can be frustrating. Um, and one of our key things is making sure that we're motivating the students. So it's not particularly motivating if you think that at the end of your year, your stuff's going to be thrown away because it's no good. So it's about getting the message across that we've all been there, we're all going through it. Whenever you design something, there are things that you do that you don't end up using. And that's okay because you are part of the process. So we do have difficulties progressing the system as a, as a whole. Um, knowledge management. And there are areas that remain untouched. So just, I just tried to summarize the challenges and what we do in order to um, provide some kind of solution. So our team turnover, the key thing for us is knowledge management. Um, we have systems set up, don't we? You know these now, <laughs> good. Um, to make sure that we have the best handover we can from year to year. Sometimes, well, all the time, we have insufficient team expertise for what we want to do this year. So the first thing we do is we negotiate with the team. This, these are the, the raft of things we think we need to do. What can you achieve as a team? And then Bill and I have to plug the gaps. Um, we, because of our experience now, Bill's experience of working on WUSAT for many years, mine were out in the wider industry, we do give tutorials and try and get the team up to speed as quickly as possible. But we can't give an aerospace engineering degree within a few weeks. But we, we do have support from a wider team, which we'll talk about in a minute. The other big thing, what if it doesn't work? What if what we design, we've done through, we've gone the process right, but we've come up with a design that's not going to work. So we try, we really do try <laughs> to do a rigorous systems engineering approach where we're methodical, we're making sure that everybody in the team is, is working together and that we do try and, and have a project management approach that looks at milestones. And this is going to become particularly relevant as we get closer to a launch and we're having to justify to those who are prepared to stump up the money um, to let us launch funding. We all know, Jim's mentioned it so many times with AMSAT, um, bigger AMSAT US. We don't have the funds as a university department to go and launch a spacecraft. So we're very dependent on anticipating where that might come from. We take a slightly different approach. We haven't built it and then gone, anybody going to launch? We've anticipated that we will get a launch with ESA on their Fly Your Satellite program. And that's what we started right from day one. Um, taking into account that that was not just a shot in the dark that was building on the, the success of, of WUSAT 2 and the Rexus launch where the head of the ESA education office at the time said you might want to think about FYS think about NanoRax etc etc so we, we have had some kind of direction and by increasing our impact through the mission that we select we've been able to bring in a lot more attention and therefore impact and over the last few weeks even uh, because for our submission to a launch campaign we've had to get underwriting from the university so that if we have quite a lot of things to buy that they will actually pay for it sorry david um, it's been very important to increase that outreach whether it's through amsat which is a natural natural link to those who are interested in our mission, which I'll come to in a minute. So we try to emulate real world projects and by getting onto a launch program like Fly Your Satellite, um, we believe that this takes it from the pseudo real world to the real world because we will not get in the project if we're not reasonably credible about what we're doing. But what's really important is this motivation of the students and trying not to stifle innovation because it's fantastic to watch and I have to step back sometimes and go, yeah, yeah, that's really, that's really interesting. So we do take a systems engineering approach. Don't know out there, anybody systems engineer? No, roughly, yes, great, one guy in 
the corner, prize to you later. Um, <laughs> systems engineering is it's just a, a process, it's a methodology of getting people to work together consistently and taking from a concept through making sure that we un understand what we're trying to build, so writing requirements or at least understanding requirements, defining architectures, coming through detailed design where we're, if you're involved in the satellite design for AMSAT, you'll know that you know the power subsystem always wants more mass than da da da. So it's always the negotiation between the subsystems guys to make sure that they understand they can't just go off and design what they want without considering the bigger picture. Then there's the implementation phase and finally putting it all together, testing it as a system, hoping it all works, getting it launched and Bob's your uncle, do a bit of operations and everybody's happy. <laughs> That's the theory. <laughs> Our big, big, big headache obviously is financing the CubeSat and this is, I'll tell you why this is so relevant at the moment because as Christian knows, we couldn't have believed we could have worse timing for this conference because ESA put out a call for the launch programme in the summer. The proposal is due in tomorrow. <laughs> so whilst Bill is ill, hi Bill, um, we are still managing to pull this together and we hope to have our proposal in, well we will have our proposal in tomorrow and hopefully it will be successful. But in order to do that, you have to demonstrate that you understand how you're going to fund this thing. Partly so that ESA have an idea that you're credible and partly so the university doesn't sign off to a, a million pound budget. So we do need lots of things. We need experience, we need hardware, uh, both space and ground. We need software licenses for doing analysis. We need registration and licensing fees, which as we know are not a small uh, issue we need indemnity insurance in case something falls out of the sky and hits somebody on the head. Um, we need test equipment, we need travel expenses to go to reviews uh, and we need a launch. So how we fund it, we start with very basic funding from the School of Engineering which is like any other project, fourth year project, so I think we get about £200, it's not going to go very far. <laughs> we get sponsorship from, as in cash, spondulies, <laughs> that we can actually spend on things that we want to spend on. And Mark, Marks and Clark is a fabulous IP company, if anybody's interested in IP. Um, and the, the link there is that one of our alumni now works for them, so there is a link. You never burn any bridges. We then have uh, experience, so the likes of Roke, who are, have helped us to define our mission, Airbus, who help to uh, review our work as we go along and keep the students motivated by going and having a look around their facilities, Biotrack, which is an animal tracking company, which will become very clear later, and this is just my little company, that, so I'm a systems engineer. We have equipment manufacturers and they have very generously give us whatever we want within reason. XCAM in particular have, have given us an engineering model and a flight model of a TRL9 camera, a technology readiness level 9 camera, which has flown on CubeSats before, um, which we need for our mission. And we have a number of software companies who help us to do our thermal analysis and vibration analysis, etc. And as I mentioned, so School of uh, University of Warwick have now recognised that we are beyond a fourth year project. They've recognised the impact, potential impact for the university. And crucially, they are willing to underwrite us now. We're targeting a Fly Your Satellite launch with ESA. And so hopefully we've got it all wrapped up. This is last year's team. I just wanted to put some faces up there because we talk about technology and what have you, but really it's down to the students. <laughs> this is last year's team and 
they have come on so much in a year. Their confidence has grown by working on this real life project. They each have a, a technical function that they do as, as a prime role. They each have an admin function. Um, and this is where they, they got to. So this is a sort of co concatenation of last year's team and the two teams before that. The important thing for us was to come up with a mission concept. So we spoke with, with one of our partners, Rogue Manor Research, and they suggested that we do an, a novel RF direction finding payload. But we wanted to, we wanted to capitalize on that um, by thinking what could that payload be used for. And again, they came up trumps and they suggested that we could use it for monitoring as a concept, use it for monitoring wildlife. So wildlife tracking is, it's a fairly young um, way of doing things. Um, but there's such variety in wildlife that there's always going to be another form of tracking that could be proposed. So we are proposing a very specific type of, of tagging um, that would allow us to have smaller, lighter tags. And it's complementary to a system that's being developed by the Max Planck Institute called Icarus. So the, the mission is to demonstrate the feasibility of a novel RF signal direction finding technique from space, which would be of benefit to monitoring wildlife for conservation and, and research. So from there, we looked at, OK, we're targeting an International Space Station launch. That really fixes what our mission analysis is going to be. And this is a, just an image of the ground track. So. 20 minutes. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> okay, um, so you, uh, hopefully some of you are familiar with the International Space Station ground track, but, it, but in essence, we're going to be looking at a, a repeat cycle over the same spot, and we think of Warwick um, when we're thinking repeat cycles because we have to think about how we're going to communicate with satellite approximately every three days. Eclipse duration about 35 minutes in a 90 minute orbit for the for the deep eclipse, the umbra. Orbit degradation, Jim, you mentioned about space debris. We're thinking, but we have to do some analysis, that we're looking at about two and a half years in orbit, not for the mission lifetime. Mission lifetime, when we started this, we were looking at 28 days. That was the indication we were getting just for as in we need to survive for 28 days. We'll be glad if we survive for a day. <laughs> but it, it very much changes how you think about reliability and radiation hardened equipment, etc. Now Fly Your Satellite is, is talking about a minimum of six months. So we just need to think about that a, a bit. Um, but yeah, hopefully we'll be able to survive for at least six months doing something. Um, so we need to think about the operational scenario and particularly our ground station visibility and how we're going to communicate with the, the satellite. Just to give you an overview of the system, so we're talking about a launch via the International Space Station. So we'll take one of the supply missions, hopefully, if we get onto the project. Got to get that proposal in. Um, and from there, we will be deployed from a CubeSat deployer We've designed for the nanoracks, but there are various other ones that we need to be a flexible with. We will be ejected out, and after 30 minutes of, we have to be shut down for 30 minutes. After 30 minutes, we should wake up. We'll be tumbling in a sort of unknown way. We have to detumble, and then we need to point the spacecraft to the Earth so that we can start our commissioning and our operations, routine operations. So routine operations, I, I'll be able to show you it in a bit more detail, but essentially this is our wildlife down here, transmitting with an RFID tag up to the spacecraft. Now if you think um, the Icarus system that I mentioned is looking at six milliwatt tags being detected. They have a, a system actually on board the ISS at the moment, they're doing some tests with it. So six milliwatt tags being detected in low Earth orbit, it's quite a challenge. Um, 
we started out thinking we would try and do the same thing. Um, <laughs> I think we're tending towards, we might just have a whopping great as much as we can. I think the limit is, is two watts um, in RFID ID for Europe. Uh, and then we'll see what, the, what we need to put on board in order to achieve that link budget. Um, so the tag will transmit, we will receive the tag signal, we'll do some other things like taking a picture and we'll send everything back down to the Woosak ground station. Sounds very grand, it'll be somebody's laptop somewhere um, with a big antenna farm uh, in Warwick or out at my house in the middle of the Cotswolds. Um, and we'll do that for as long as we can, targeting six months. And at the end, we will probably have to do some kind of pacifying to make sure that we're not dangerous um, in orbit, which is, is being taken very seriously. It's not just a pain, it's a pain for a reason. So we're very serious about the students understanding the loop, making sure that, that they are not creating problems for the future. And then, yeah, so end of life decommissioning and then probably just track it to see what happens next. So that just looks at this detumbling, earth pointing, operations, etc. Um, and we do, we will have to do some other. So once we've detumbled, we have to decide whether we're going to deploy antennas first. We don't have deployable solar arrays, thank goodness. Um, but part of our payload, uh, and I'll confuse you in a minute, but part of our payload is a deployable antenna, four patch antennas on, on these arms. Um, so this, this was the kind of the end point of last year's, not quite the end point, this was the end point of the team before, this was the starting point of, for last year's team. Uh, we had to look at camera selection, we had to look at data handling, which we didn't manage to achieve in the team because of lack of expertise, time, etc. Power system, attitude determination control system. Uh, etc etc what you'll notice is we do not have a propulsion system so we're wh wherever we get thrown out we're happy um, but it does mean that we don't have that complication which is good and you can see that we are a three unit CubeSat we've the, the first year's team came up with this concept of an inner cage which would allow us to integrate deintegrate play with the thing uh, more easily it may cause us a few headaches which we need to look at this year but that's the, the ingoing position look, one of the big things last year was to actually get that systems engineering on the paper um, so it systems engineering has, has always been a bit of a struggle uh, partly because we haven't always managed to get systems engineers onto the team um, partly because the systems engineer me didn't arrive until later um, but this, so this was a first stab from the team looking at a functional breakdown of the whole system. So the space segment and then the, obviously the need for ground segment, data processing, a user segment, image taking, etc. And it shows, it, it allows us to, to show all the transfers and all the needs for power. So transfers of telemetry and telecommand. Um, and, and obviously the links down to the ground as well. So you can see we've got one link, two links, three links, four links, four comms links for the system. We've tried to get the teams to do rigorous trade-offs. So they, in order to do a trade-off, you need to know what your design criteria are, what your constraints are. Um, these are just some of them. Um, but they did a really good job last year of really getting into the trade-offs and um, this is an example. So one of the key things for our mission is that we have deployable antennas, so a, a four antenna, multi-element antenna, which is, allows us to detect the signal from the tag and from those tiny little differences in offset and... Yeah, I know. <laughs> that gives us a location of the signal. It's not this is a direction finding done by um, Doppler. It's, it's from these offsets. And then Roke's uh, novel direction finding technique is to then take an image of the nadir, of what's below, um, and then to locate that 
direct that position on the image and from what's in the image you can then better identify the location. So this is purely a technology demonstrator. It's kind of characterizing what can be done. It's not saying, yeah, we can tell you where that owl is within 10, 10 centimeters. Most of the, direct, the, the animal tagging at the moment is done either with a guy on the ground with, with a, an antenna, Yagi or whatever, um, or using GPS receivers. But the issue with GPS receivers is that the tag on the animal has to be big in order to have the, the necessary power. So anyway, this was the trade-off that last year's team did in order to integrate this camera. The issue with the camera, even though it was beautiful in TRL level 9, was that with nanoracks, nanoracks expect rails along the edge of the CubeSat, and that meant that the camera didn't quite fit. So we had to go innovative and look at all the different options and look at various trade-off criteria, etc., etc. And it came out that this configuration was optimal. It's not perfect, but it's the best that we could do. Um, but that was right at the end of last year. So now what we have to do is to go, so all of the analysis we've done, thermal, vibration, mass, da 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 da, it's all based on this. So the big task this year is to go, okay, take this option and start again totally again um, but that's where we are so incoming team arrived two weeks ago big job there's Ole so these are these are pictures of them as first years so apologies <laughs> you get your proper photo next week again a, a fantastic team um, you can see from the diversity we've got system two students on the systems engineering team which is great for me didn't have that last year we've got mechanical engineers and we've got electrical engineers but this just summarizes so this is just a functional breakdown so boxes again I'm a systems engineer I love structure and boxes but what I wanted to show to the team was at the beginning of year four we thought a lot of these boxes were green now we've gone back to a lot of them being orange and by that I mean ooh, we've got some issues so this is just the space segment what we've decided this year is that rather than spreading the experience across space and ground we would focus the student team on the space segment and Bill and I will fill in the gaps with the ground and the user segment <laughs> um, so we've got quite a lot of red boxes there all of the ones underneath will be red as well However, as I mentioned, we've had a breakthrough this summer, you could call it a breakthrough, that ESA have put out the call for the next Fly Your Satellite um, project. And for those of you who don't know what Fly Your Satellite is, just a... Deployers. This is just a nanoracks deployer, which is a, a hole with a big spring at the end, and it pings you out the, the end. 
So the objectives for this year's team, one of the issues that we found from last year was it was, it was difficult to get the team to understand that you can come up with all these fancy ideas, but it's all got to fit. And unless you know the detail of everything, you won't even know whether it's, you won't even be able to put it together to see if it fits. So it's a typical system engineering cycle where you've got to take that first step. So the, the, big, the big goal for this year is to come up with what we're calling a configuration model. And we want the team to, at the end of the year, have a, a mock-up. It's not materially uh, representative, but physically, space-wise, size-wise, and component-wise, we want it to be representative so that <coughs> next year we can go on to do a flat sat and an EM, etc. Um, this is this is one of those mini projects I was talking about to try and motivate the team to move forward, to move in the right direction. Um, but there's an awful lot behind that. As a side activity, um, they're lucky enough to be in the year where we may get onto a launch program, and part of that is a selection process, so they need to be able to support that selection process. If we get onto that, that's in December, so we've got two months to get the team up to speed that they can support us in that selection process, no pressure. Um, and if we don't get onto the launch program, then we will be trying to progress the team to a critical design review. So I said there's a lot behind that configuration model. Essentially, for a new team, they've got to review the requirements that they're working against. So why are they doing it? What do they have to do? They have to look at that functional physical breakdown. They need to select the equipment. They need to look at the technical budgets to make sure that we're within the mass, power, etc., um, budget constraints and they need to come up with a configuration layout. And that looks very linear, it's not. It's going to be all over the place like that. Um, effectively, there'll be, again, I love boxes. They'll be looking at, you're not supposed to be able to read this, by the way, it's just indicative. They need to be able to break the system down so that they can see that, yes, the power subsystem needs a man-rated battery and a power generation solar cells and discharge regulator, etc. So then the system engineering that we'll be doing, concurrent engineering, if anybody's familiar with it, is about getting team members to work together and that's a really big thing for us. We do problem solving sessions where everybody's in the same room, we set a task, um, coordinating trade-offs uh, and design justifications. The systems engineers are, are responsible for maintaining the budget, so they're the ones that say, no, if you want a bigger battery, then I need to take some power, bu power um, mass budget off somebody else. So it's, it's that uh, coordination between team members. They need to maintain the interfaces, so they're only doing the space segment. Bill and I are doing the ground segment. We need to make sure they're talking together, etc. So looking at the operations concept, this is one of our biggest drivers. It's not just that we're listening for telemetry. So here's the Earth, here's our pseudo bird, and here's our ground station at Warwick University or in my back garden. Satellite is coming over the horizon. Don't, no comment from you. <laughs> we need to establish the telemetry telecommand links. We'll be having our little pseudo tag radiating. The satellite will continue on its orbital track, detect the signal, take an image, and it will just catch the birdie. And it will start to then downlink. This is as we see it at the moment. This might not work once we realise that we haven't got the bandwidth, etc. But uh, at the moment, this is what we're assuming. Start downlinking the image and the offsets from the antenna. Continue on our orbital track, keep sending, keep sending. And then the, the darker blob, we will do it all again. So the intention is that we take multiple images of the same tag location 
as we go in our orbit. And that will improve the accuracy of our direction finding capability. Again, though, it's just a question of characterization. Our attitude determination control system, we plan on cheating. We plan on going out and buying. Um, we have done four years of design work on it, which has been amazing. But this is one of those ones that's gone off the, the chart. It's been an amazing experience. It's been great for all of us to try and understand how it all works. But it is such a key component that hopefully we'll si find somebody out there. Anybody got an ADCS they want to give, it, give us? Um, hopefully we'll, we'll get a proprietary solution there. Data handling was one of those big red boxes that we just haven't been able to address. Thankfully, one of the students this year, two of the students this year, have said they really want to work on data handling. So this is one of our really big ones this year that we can get our teeth into. Uh, lots to do in terms of how we get the data around how we send down telemetry, receive telecommands, action, things with them. This is the little camera that costs, caused us all the heartache last year. Um, we've looked at it from a mechanical integration point of view, but not from a power point of view, data handling. So all of that comes into this detailed design in order to be able to do a configuration model. That's just some of the statistics on, on if anybody's interested in how good it is. I think it's about 200 kilometer square um, field of view. Power subsystem is, was the green box, the one green box. Um, we are fairly confident with our design at the moment. There are some tweaks. We, we realize that our battery, so our power storage system that we identified needs to be man rated if we're going to the ISS. Um, so we've identified a pro proprietary uh, battery from Clyde Space there. Our power budget is in place. I wouldn't say it's robust at all. Um, but we have looked at it from the perspective of the operational modes, which comes back to our payload operations and what things we're going to be having going on at the same time. Communication subsystems, for those of you out there who may want to be listening, um, we have four antennas. Uh, at the moment, so this is our uplink. We're looking at the RFID, open access RFID um, frequency of 915 megahertz which is valid within Europe, so we may well have a pseudo bird tag in Germany. Um, unfortunately, we can't. We thought we would be able to put more around the world, but we can't. Payload transmitting antenna, at the moment we've gone for 2.29 gigahertz, but I appreciate that this is not the amateur band. The reason for that was because the students felt that the information was sensitive at the time, um, because I think they were taking uh, the, the wildlife monitoring to heart, but because it's only a, a pseudo tag, uh, we may well go to 2.4 gigahertz on that one. We would welcome some support on that one, Barry. Um, that would give us some uh, cheaper options for reception and on board as well. And then telemetry and telecommand, we're looking at 435 megahertz downlink and 144 megahertz uplink. And from a ground segment, ground station perspective, uh, a lot of work was done last year by one of the students. At the time, we thought we had no money to buy a proprietary uh, kit. Um, it's just that. Uh, but actually, we've had an offer since then for a ground station. So we're very happy that we may be able to just go proprietary on that as well. For our uplink, this is our six milliwatt, quite unrealistic potentially link budget. It, it looks okay, but I think if you get into the detail, it's probably a little bit dodgy. So we may well be upping the, uh, the pseudo tag power and uh, having a bit more margin on that one. So that is Olay's task for this year. That's our ground station design. On the thermal side, we had done quite a lot of work but because of the new configuration, we need to do it all again. Um, but the method is there, and we have a member of the team who is going to further that work. Structure and mechanisms. Primarily, the, the role this year is to look at the mechanisms, because we 
we have done quite a bit of work <coughs> on it, but again, it was making very some assumptions based on the old configuration. If we get all that done, this is what we hope to achieve, being pinged out of the ISS. This is a very, very representative, oh, unrepresentative timeline. There are so many unknowns in here. We have no clue what ESA's timetable is. We have no idea how long it's going to take us to even get selected if we're lucky enough. But this is what we're working on. So phase, e, phase C, which is the detailed design phase in ESA speak, we are hoping that we will be in a good shape by the end of this academic year. That will mean we can go on to build and test next year. <laughs> and we could then be launched by the middle of next year. Uh -huh. uh, but it, in essence, we need to be ready to store for up to three years. That's what the, the requirement is. So it could well be that we're all retired by that stage. <laughs> um, and then six months of operations, a mission review, and allowing it to the orbit to decline. So why do we need you? Before the launch, outreach is a really big thing for us. We would love it if any of you are interested in keeping on our WUSAT watchers list. We send out newsletters every so often to let you know what's going on. Um, and for those of you who want to be a bit more active, then you might want to prepare for listening in. After launch, of course, there has to be a first. So we're looking for the first amateur to receive a signal from WUSAT 3. Um, and because of our current operational scenario where we're only intending to get telemetry when, we're, when it's passing over our ground station, we're looking for anybody that would be willing to receive telemetry and pass it on to us. That may change, but w the intention is that the telemetry is open access. And for those who are really into it, for anybody that would like to receive our payload data as well and pass it on to us, have a look. It, it should be open as well. Thank you very much. Sorry I've gone on a bit. Any questions? First of all, that's strong appreciation. That's a very <laughs> What I'll do is I'll, um, if anyone's got any questions, I'll hand the microphone round. But I think you set up the bar pretty high. Six milliwatts that far away. <laughs> and the tech, I'm not going into it. Go so if you've got any questions, yeah. if you can say who you are, please, and what the question is then. Uh, Mike Brooks, M0 PKG. Um, I was very interested in your um, systems engineering design. Um, as a, a data analytics engineer myself in big data systems, I'm not restricted to the um, uh, uh, things that you're restricted to. I can scale my cloud solutions if I want. You know, it's, it's great. But the thing is, it seemed to be a waterfall uh, approach from a project management perspective and actually gaining that funding, because that's the, the, the problems that we have. But yeah, it seems to be an iterative and agile delivery, able to change on the fly, you know, as per the configuration <laughs> yeah. change. Yes, you, you've kind of hit the nail on the head that it's, it's never quite as the textbooks say. So we use the V model. The, the one where I showed requirements uh, w looked more like a, a waterfall, but as I said, that was, in reality, it's far more of an, sort of an agile approach, mixed in with a V, mixed in with the waterfall. It's whatever works for us at the time, and we have to be really reactive to how the students are, coping is the wrong word, because they cope very well, but ha what issues they're finding, and sort of drive them, have you thought about this, have you got that recorded? It all ties in with knowledge management. Um, and we also have to, if we're going to get on the ESA program, we have to follow ESA standards within a tailored environment. So I don't know if you're familiar with the ESA standards. They've got masses of standards, um, which are designed for the big satellite world where I come from. So I'm very familiar with them. And a lot of it is totally irrelevant. We would get so bogged down in paperwork and what have you, we have to trade off risk against our method of, of working. So we use whatever we can to, to get a systems engineering approach in there. Yeah, hope we can have a chat on it. Okay, thank you. Have we got another question from the floor? Come on, you're not all dumbstruck. Ah. Uh, 
Heather Lohman, M zero eight GMO. I was just wondering, how do you register for the uh, WUSAC uh, watchers? Oh, okay. So, one of us just send an email to one of us, and we'll pop you on the list. Good point. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, another one. Yeah, hello, um, G1PRM Anne. Um, I was interested in your comments about the um, the educational yeah. framework that you're working in, and um, obviously the, the sort of systems engineering and project management part of it has a an impact on that, which over a period of time I imagine is a bit sort of hard to predict. Mm. So you've got several years of students who've gained all sorts of experiences, but they don't all obviously have the same experience. Do you find that when they, I mean that could be a problem for the students themselves because it's like well I've done all this work and I don't even get to see the thing fly, mm. which is maybe that's kind of how we feel in the amateur world yeah. but I imagine young students might think that too. And also when they go out into the big wide world and they're doing their CVs, is there, you know, do they manage to make that leap into employers who know they've only seen maybe a relatively small part? Sorry, that's a rather long question. No, no, no. I'll, I'll um, shut up and very let you good answer. Question, actually. Um, just in terms of how employers see the students, what we, we did a survey last year of all our alumni of how we did WUSAT ever crop up in their interviews or you know were their employers interested in it? And it was remarkable the number of people who said, yes, we sent in our CVs, it had one line about WUSAT and we spent the whole interview talking about WUSAT. So it does seem to catch the imagination, both from the space is cool thing, um, but also because it's a sort of pseudo real world environment. It doesn't matter that they've only seen a bit because that's real world as well. So you get some people that only work on feasibility studies, some people only work on operations. Um, but it's about their adaptability and it's showing that they've gone from knowing nothing about space to being able to design a power subsystem for a satellite. Um, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, okay we'll have to wind this session up now. Um, Sorry. Much appreciation again. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>